States of America. Since this is the United case, one year ago, we said the corporations have the same rights of people to spend their money however they want on elections. There's almost no restrictions, and that's the way it should be because corporations are people. Well, just see what's happening in the United States. We voted to give the corporations even more control over our elections than they already had. And we sold out the American people one more time. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I voted against this awful idea. I'm Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm an Oreo. I believe my colleagues just bought the best democracy money can buy. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I host this series of half-hour public access cable TV programs which are broadcast once a week from the studios of Portland Community Media here in Portland, Oregon. Our guest today is Dr. Zahir Wahab. Uh, Dr. Wahab is a professor of education at Lewis and Clark uh, College here in Portland, Oregon in the uh, Graduate School of Education and Counseling. He has master's degrees uh, and a PhD in international development education from Stanford University. He is a native of Afghanistan where he frequently returns, uh, spending about four months there each year. He has served as senior advisor to the Minister of Higher Education of Afga in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2006. Uh, he was our guest last week and we were originally intending to talk about Afghanistan and we uh, immediately got diverted to talking about education policy and the future of education in, in the United States. So uh, today we're going to focus on Afghanistan. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you for having me. Yes, nice right. to be with you. Yes, right. So you were the senior advisor uh, from 2006 to 2000, excuse me, 2002 to 2006. Right. Since then, you've been going back every year for yeah. four months. And what have you been doing yeah. back there? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, very early in 2002, uh, as soon as the Taliban were ejected from uh, power, uh, uh, one day I uh, received a telephone call in my office here at Lewis and Clark College uh, uh, from a man saying, uh, I'm Dr. So-and-so, he's also an Afghan-American with a PhD, uh, and he said, I was just appointed Minister of Higher Education, uh, we don't know each other, but I've heard about you, um, will you come and help me? Uh, and I said, sure, I would be more than happy to come and uh, see what I can do. So uh, I um, went to Afghanistan, I was not teaching that semester. Uh, I went to Afghanistan for the first time. Well, I have always gone back, David, you know, because I still have some family there. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I have gone back and visited, not officially, of course, but unofficially. Uh, but since 2002, um, I have uh, spent at least a semester there every year, uh, and Lewis and Clark College has been kind enough to accommodate me and support me in my efforts to contribute to um, uh, the rebuilding of higher education in Afghanistan. So I first went there very early in 2002 uh, and was sort of the minister's handyman. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two ministries in Afghanistan, the Ministry of Higher Education and then there's the Ministry of Education, uh, each uh, having its own functions and jurisdiction. Uh, so for the first five years, I was uh, essentially uh, the minister's handyman and I did everything that needed to be done, whether it was meeting foreign uh, dignitaries or, you know, sometimes writing the minister's emails and speeches or trying to make sure that, uh, you know, um, uh, 
uh, things are done okay in the ministry, or at least there's one working uh, bathroom <laughs> in oh. the whole ministry, <laughs> uh, you know, that people could use. Um, and then um, uh, for the, after the, in the, uh, 2006, um, there was a, a program with the, you know, uh, the United States Agency for International Development and uh, uh, a nonprofit organization, Academy for Education Development in Washington, D.C. Uh, they um, uh, embarked on a um, $40 million five-year program to um, work on main aspects of the higher education. As you can imagine, uh, this country has been at war for the last 35 years now, mm -hmm. and all of its institutions, schools, hospitals, you know, hydroelectric dams, canals, roads, uh, buildings, uh, you know, everything has been pretty much destroyed and decimated. Uh, and the same uh, is true for education, so a lot needs to be done still. Uh, so in 2005, uh, this idea that we should work on um, certain aspects of higher education, and uh, uh, I have been working with that. And one of the uh, one uh, program that we uh, are working on and have been working on is to um, upgrade the uh, uh, credentials and knowledge and skills and abilities of university faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Afghanistan now has uh, 23 uh, uh, public uh, universities and colleges, uh, about 3,000 professors and maybe 80,000 students and 10,000 workers. But the professors, only 5 or 6 percent of them have uh, PhDs and doctorate degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and these degrees were also obtained uh, quite some years ago. Uh, and then maybe another 32, 33 percent have master's degrees, but the vast majority of the people who teach in Afghan institutions of higher learning only have bachelor degrees. Oh, hmm. So there are 17 um, teacher training programs, uh, training teachers for middle and high schools, and the vast majority of them are only have bachelor's degrees, often from the very same university. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind this program is to um, bring these men and women from uh, throughout the country, uh, 17 institutions, uh, and uh, put them through this master's degree program, which lasts for f uh, two years, four semesters. Uh, we graduated, uh, uh, we have graduated two groups. Uh, each cohort consists of 22 people, 11 men, 11 women. Uh, we have made sure that the program is gender balanced, but also that different ethnic groups, regional groups, and different universities are being represented. We are very careful uh, because in Afghanistan, everything is politicized and can very easily be politicized. Mm -hmm. So we're very careful in our selection process other than considering a potential. So uh, I was involved in this uh, master's degree program, which really was the, the first graduate program in Afghanistan and, and continues to be one of the two or three programs, uh, master's degree uh -huh. program in the whole country. And uh, it's now managed by the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and part of it is by Indiana University. So I have been involved with this program from the very beginning in terms of the conceptualizing the program and designing the curriculum and sequencing the courses. And then I have been teaching five of the, the, the courses in the program. There are 10 courses, so I am about half of the program. Oh. Um, so uh, this last spring, for example, uh, I taught uh, two courses, uh, Principles of Teaching and Learning, which is sort of introduction to education, and then a course in educational leadership. Uh, and when I go back, I'll be teaching courses in um, uh, educational planning, uh, research and assessment, uh, but also uh, uh, an integrated uh, uh, sort of a capstone um, course uh, where the program sort of uh, uh, ends uh, and, and, and advising people to do um, a thesis. So that's what I've been doing. Oh, okay. All uh, right. That sounds busy. Do you, do you spend any time actually here in the United States at Lewis and Clark teaching anymore? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Lewis and Clark, as I said, ha has been very kind uh, and very accommodating and very supportive. Mm -hmm. We have three semesters at Lewis and Clark College, uh, summer, fall, and winter. Uh, and as a professor, you must teach 15 semester hours in a given year. Uh, but you can talk to your dean and your chair, depending on the circumstances. Uh, you can uh, do your 15 semester hours over three semesters uh, here, or you can compress your work oh. into two semesters and then uh, you have a semester free to mm -hmm. do whatever you wanted. Uh, for the last, I think, 13 or 14 years, I must say, uh, I have done all of my work here uh, in two semesters. Usually it's summer and fall. So mm -hmm. right now, 
I am really, really busy um, at the, during the summer. Uh, so I do two semesters here, and then I spend a semester in, in Afghanistan. And it's uh, great because I think, um, you know, I can take some things from here, ideas, knowledge, know-how, and so forth, uh, and sort of uh, transfer, you know, and make those ideas and knowledge appropriate to the uh, the faculty there, and I come back with some insights and understandings and data uh, to talk about with my students here. So it works just fine. Okay, well, very good. Let's talk about your criticisms of the Afghan war, the, the yeah. American, the American episode of this Afghan war, because as you said, they've been, uh, they've had wars. I would say imposed on them for the past 30 years. Yes, more than 30, th about 35 years. 35 yes. years, it's yes. a very, very long time. Yes, yeah. It, it, it's a, t talk a little bit about wh why you yeah. have been critical of the yeah. American uh, yeah. uh, well, attack. Well, uh, it is an attack and it is an occupation and I'm not the only one, the first one or the last one. You know, I mean, uh, half of Congress now is critical of this yes, war uh -huh. and they want it ended and about 65% of the American public is against this war and want it ended. Mm -hmm. And most of the allies, that is say, the 46 countries that are have, that have troops in Afghanistan, can you believe this? Wow. There are troops from 37 different countries, from New Zealand to Ukraine, hmm. to the United States, to NATO, to non-NATO people. Uh, 37, 47 different countries waging war on the poorest and least developed country on the planet. Uh, there's something wrong with that in and of itself. There is, yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, well, uh, and as I said, you know, uh, th this country has been, uh, you know, experiencing war, civil wars, uh, imposed wars by the Soviet Union and uh, now the United States and uh, NATO allies. Uh, and then there might be another civil war. Uh, it's almost like the country was cursed uh, mm -hmm. from its very beginning. Uh, and. Uh, I'm critical of the war because uh, I'm critical of all wars. I don't think that war is a very good uh, way to settle conflicts, whether it's between individuals or groups or families or uh, amongst people within a country or amongst countries. Uh, you know, uh, these conflicts have some reasons. There are reasons for people in countries to have conflict and differences. Uh, and I think those there are channels and avenues for that uh, that should be utilized before we resort to war. Um, uh, uh, as I have said, you know, um, it was wrong for the United States to attack uh, and then uh, occupy Afghanistan to begin with. Uh, because uh, Afghans really had nothing to do with 9-11. 9-11, as most of our viewers know, was launched by uh, Al-Qaeda and Arabs, uh, and the Taliban tried very hard to avert the war before the United States attacked uh, in um, um, 2000, October 2001. Uh, the Taliban were willing to, to do whatever it would take to avert this war, uh, but uh, the Bush administration would not um, hear any of that. Uh, and also that uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are not the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they were not the same, they don't have the same agenda. The Taliban have never had anything against the United States or American people or the American government. They just want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. And we also know that at the time there was very um, strong disagreement and conflict between the Qaeda leadership, which the United States had incidentally trained, uh, you know, calmed and supported and mm -hmm. brought to Afghanistan to work to fight against the Soviet Union. Uh, and this, the United States also should take responsibility not only for training the Al Qaeda and supporting them, but also the Taliban and the Mujahideen. All these three groups from all over the world were, mm -hmm. you know, sponsored, trained, subsidized, and paid, protected by the United States mm -hmm. to fight the Soviet Union. Right. So the Afghans really had nothing to do with 9 11. It was Arabs and Al Qaeda. Uh, and as I said, the Taliban tried to. So that's one reason. Uh, and so it's a form of, I consider it like a form of collective punishment, punishing a people for something they have not done. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, studies by the, um, uh, there's a, a think tank uh, called the International Council on Security and Development, uh, I think it's based in Belgium. Uh, they did studies of the people in, in Afghanistan just about a year ago. They showed them pictures of the towers collapsing, the trade, uh, World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. 
And they asked these men different samples. Uh, they said, do you recognize these pictures? And the people said, no, we have no idea. What are these pictures about? Mm -hmm. So a lot of Afghans, they, I mean, they, because they had nothing to do with 9-11. But also, uh, again, you know, uh, this is a very costly war. You know, we have bankrupted this country. Uh, this ca war in Afghanistan alone has cost half a trillion dollars so far. So, yeah, so uh, far. And about 2,000, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and it's costing us, you know, this year we'll be spending about $120 billion. Uh, you know, the United States alone spends $10 billion a month on this war. The U.S. alone spends $1 million to keep one soldier in Afghanistan for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of money, and here we're bankrupt. You know, we're, yes. uh, you know, we're firing we're, teachers and nurses and yeah. doctors and so mm -hmm. forth. Right. So that's another that it's very our, costly. Yeah, and our U.S. Congress just approved a new de defense budget, you yes, know, which, which actually had an increase mm -hmm. over over the previous one. While the rest of us are being told that we have to yes. tighten our belts and yes. um, look forward to cuts in 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 in, in entitlements. Yes, yes. I mean, we all know. You know, there were a major report just came out uh, uh, from uh, done at Brown University, and this is a very credible report because it is done by very well-established scholars saying the two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, which both of these were wars of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, these two have cost essentially all of the direct and indirect costs would be four trillion dollars. That's what they're talking about now in Washington, D.C. Yes, you know, mm -hmm. so, so they have been costly, and you know, about 2,000 Americans have been killed, 15,000 maimed, tens of thousands of Afghans, men, women, children, combatants, and civilians, innocent people have been killed, and we have wrecked that country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for these reasons, you know, I am against this, uh, because, um, you know, it's costly, uh, it's unjust, it's unfair, it's undeserved, and we should explore alternatives. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, great. And why do, you, why do you think that the United States, obviously 911, the excuse that Bush used yeah. to, to attack 911 uh, yes. yes. uh, and the towers uh, was a false excuse? It w yeah. well, why, why did we actually go in there? Well, um, our viewers might know that there's uh, an organization called Project for the New American Century. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a group of uh, elite, these, I call them the uh, warlords in the uh, sort of Washington, D.C. area. Uh, people like, uh, you know, Vice President Cheney, Rumsfeld, uh, uh, Dr. Khalil Zad, the Afghan-American, uh, you know, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Douglas Feith, and uh, uh, a small group of people like that who put this document together even when Cl President Clinton was president, Project for the New American Century, and the idea is that uh, with the former Soviet Union dissolving and disappearing, uh, there really is no deterrence to America and that uh, this would be a good time for the United States to so assert its uh, hegemony, if not direct control, on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of our uh, viewers might know also that before the attack on Afghanistan, there was a serious debate in the Pentagon whether to attack Afghanistan first or Iraq, because the decision was already made by these people who signed the Project for the New American Century. The idea was to take over the world, sort of control it. Uh, so it doesn't, didn't even matter. In other mm -hmm. words, the so-called the war on terror wasn't even an issue. The issue was which one of these. And the reason we're not being told, uh, we're sort of being lied to by, uh, you know, uh, the civilian government and a lot of the military, I will have to say, they have been lying to us uh, about this war uh, and how it's going. The real reason are that, you know, Afghanistan itself has enormous amounts of oil and gas. It has uh, enormous amounts of copper. Uh, the Chinese have already signed a contract for $4 billion uh, about to explore copper oh. uh, near Kabul. Um, and it has lithium, it has uranium, it has gold. Uh, you know, J.P. Morgan already is actually investing in gold in mm -hmm. Badakhshan in the northeastern oh. uh, area. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's one, it's because of the minerals and oil and gas of Afghanistan itself. But more importantly, the United States wants to make sure that it maintains some kind of control over the Caspian Sea and what's underneath that. You know, the, uh, the Central Asian countries, as you also know, have enormous uh, amounts of oil and gas. And the idea was to build a pipeline from uh, Dawlatabad, Turkmenistan, through the Western Afghanistan, 
to um, here in Pakistan and India. Uh, in fact, uh, all of the agreements, everything about a pipeline called TAPI, T-A-P-I, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Mm. Um, the papers have been signed, and the work on that will begin any time. So it's the strategic location, in addition to the strategic material of Afghanistan, it's also the strategic location. And the third reason is that uh, NATO wants to sort of deter or roll back what is called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is an organization like the equivalent of, say, or the counter to NATO, uh, consisting of Russia, China, uh, you know, and all of the Central Asian countries, uh, and now India, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan are observers. Uh, they're so going to do that. So this is a military This is a military uh, alliance. A, a okay. military, economic, cultural, mm -hmm. educational alliance. Uh, and so there's real indirect sort of struggle, uh, proxy struggle between NATO and the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I think it's also to be close to the Middle East or in er areas because you can't count on the, the, the United States has sort of lost the Arab countries, uh -huh. uh, more or less, oh, yeah. you know, because <laughs> the people have taken over. And mm -hmm. soon I think it's a matter of, of time before the Gulf states are also taken over by the people mm -hmm. uh, instead of these, our uh, governments that the produce. So it's for these reasons, you know, that the United States, and that's why the interesting, something came up just very recently, the last week, that the United States actually imposed an agreement as soon as it arrived, very early in 2002, on the Afghan government, then the Minister of um, Interior, Mr. Khanouni, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Abdullah, the United States imposed an agreement with these two countries saying the United States will be allowed to maintain a permanent military presence. Mm in Afghanistan. That treatment never went to Congress here, that uh, agreement, mm -hmm. and it was never presented to the Afghan parliament. It was just exposed just recently, uh -huh. because there are currently also talks underway where the United States insists of some kind of a military presence in Afghanistan uh, for the indefinite future. And that's why they're expanding these uh, four major airfields in Mazar sharif in Herat, uh, in Jalalabad, and in Bagram. So there are other reasons that we're not being told. This war on terror, uh, with which Afghanistan, again, had nothing to do, and you don't fight a war on terror because I think it's, it's a crime, and it should be done through police work and Interpol instead of mm -hmm. occupying people and, and you know, brutalizing them without these people having anything to do with it. But the war on terror sold it to the American people. I think more people, more and more people are understanding. It seems, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the American people <laughs> need to know uh, mm -hmm. because, again, uh, it's costing uh, a lot of money, a lot of lives, and it's, again, it's immoral, uh, it's illegal, and it's unjust, and it's counterproductive. The interesting thing now is that the war really is being lost. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in spite of, say, uh, these 150,000 troops from 47 different countries, and then for every one of the troops, there's a contractor, yeah. a civilian contractor. So there are 300,000 uh, troops uh, uh, or, you know, people who do the adjunct work, the sort of supportive work. Uh, there are people from Vietnam, from Latin America, from Africa, from other places, and those are never mentioned, no. that for every soldier there's also a contractor, mm -hmm. like Blackwater, Dyncor, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Major corporations. Major corporations. Feeding and, at the trough. And there's a lot of money to be made. Of course, you know, this war, again, uh, has cost half a trillion dollars, uh, and that money ended up someplace. Mm -hmm. And you can be sure it's not going to the Afghan peasants. Oh, right. For the vast majority of the people, life has become very, very hard. Mm -hmm. A few people have made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. A few Afghans, uh, America, Afghan Americans, Americans, and people from other countries, because it's big business. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is big business. Oh, I yes. I yeah. Yes. Right, yeah. So uh, President Obama a couple of months ago talked about uh, a withdrawal schedule. Yes. And he talked about withdrawing, I think, 33,000 troops. Yes. Um, how many does that leave behind? Well, that, uh, we still have about 110,000. Uh, I'm very disappointed uh, in President Obama because, you know, this man has won a Nobel Peace Prize for one thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and he's not only he has escalated the war in Afghanistan, you know, he's the one who tripled the number of troops in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but also has really intensified the air war. There's more bombing going on now in Afghanistan than at the height of the Iraq war, drones, uh, uh, helicopters and planes. So President Obama, in fact, intensified and escalated the war in Afghanistan. Furthermore, he extended the war to Pakistan, uh, 
-hmm. and now to Yemen, Somalia, Libya, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. So under President Obama, the Nobel laureate, you know, we are, the United States is waging wars in six countries. It's a world war. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather amazing. It's mm -hmm. rather incredible. I think it is very disappointing. Uh, and people should remember this when, uh, you know, they vote the next time. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, you know, the propaganda machine, the mainstream media, as you know, there's very little coverage of these wars. Uh, because uh, because it's very well managed, you know, Washington, the Pentagon, and the warriors in Washington have learned how to manage American public opinion, and that's what they're doing, and that's why uh, there's very little concern, there's very little knowledge, and there's very little outrage mm -hmm. about these uh, unjust, you know, uncalled for uh, in very savage and costly wars mm -hmm. in six countries. And, and, and it, would, it would appear that uh, as we as the United States moves forward with these wars and withdraws troops, that the uh, number of drones that will be used will be increasing, that they will replace the, the troops on the ground so Precisely. that our, our people will not be in danger, right. but the right. rest of the world will. Will, there are, they're using these drones and have been using these drones, as you know, in all of these uh, fields, uh, theaters of war, so to speak. Uh, I know about Afghanistan and I know something about Pakistan, you know. And that's why the vast majority of the Afghans want this ended. They w don't want the Americans or NATO troops. In fact, they don't want any foreigners doing anything in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And that's why even uh, if you go to Afghanistan and let's say you want to help with education or health care or agriculture or wa water or, you know, building, uh, you know, hydroelectric powers or roads, you're also a target. Mm -hmm. I mean... Uh, the public opinion in Afghanistan has really, really turned against all Westerners, not just the occupying, uh, you know, soldiers, uh, because, uh, you know, they're tired of this and they, they need normal lives. Um, yes, the, the air war, uh, day and night, and the other thing that really uh, Afghans dislike is these night raids, you know, there are literally, <coughs> this was uh, General Petraeus's invention both the intensification of the air war, but also these night raids uh, by special operation forces. Dozens and dozens of them take place every night. People will barge into these families, uh, and if they resist, which you are, I mean, Afghans resist. If someone comes in in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. you do resist because you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And they're shot right on the spot. So a lot of people get killed, and innocent people get killed. And that's why, you know, the majority of the Afghans want this ended, and they want the Westerners to go home. Great. Good. Thank you very much for Richard, joining welcome. us again. Yes, this Thank was you. a good conversation. Thank you. And uh, hopefully uh, after you come back from Afghanistan, the next time we'll, we'll have you on again. And, well, and let's talk hope about by progress. then that the war ends. Uh, uh, we, we, can, we, can, we can hope, right? Yes, yes we yes. can hope. Right. This is so, a very costly venture. Right. Yeah, so uh, that is our program for today. I want to thank our crew. Our crew has been Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Janice Morris, and Tom Thomas. Thank you for being here and uh, helping us bring this program to the air uh, and thank you audience for uh, watching and we hope that you will turn in again next week thank you